Good morning, everyone. Dr. Shabazz here, and today I'm going to be covering material from Chapter 4. This chapter is a very important chapter in any discipline. And this subject is dealing with social responsibility and ethics. We had a debate amongst the faculty many years ago in SBI about an ethics course. And this was at a time when there were a number of cases, most notably Enron, and we had before that MicroStrategy, where egregious violations were committed. The Enron case was uh, most notable because it involved the um, taking of shareholder investments and then using those in uh, very non-transparent ways. And there were uh, a lot of heads that rode as a result. Some whistleblowers came out and they made these um, accusations that there was cooking, the, the books were cooked to, in order to, to hide these uh, illegal activities. And obviously a number of, of people were uh, cited um, and imprisoned, and Enron no longer exists. That company was uh, uh, became a case study in companies' um, egre egregious uh, violations and lack of ethics. So we talk about this subject in marketing because a lot of times marketing is known as an area where you can be a little loose with the truth in terms of supporting uh, claims of your products. And we all have seen it with our own eyes. Companies make claims that they later have to come back and say, okay, maybe we were a little bit, um, maybe we embellished that a bit much. And of course, there are all kinds of guidelines and regulations against that. And so we'll talk about this on today in chapter four, and hopefully uh, it will be a good lesson uh, as you go forth in your careers, uh, making sure that your company is held accountable for their uh, fulfilling their mission. So what is social responsibility? All of us have a obligation. When we work for an organization, we already know about the mission. We have an obligation to be honest, to be transparent, and to make sure that we are fulfilling a basic need for the public. So in the book, the book talks about social responsibility. And they say it refers to an organization's obligation to maximize its positive impact and minimize its negative impact on society. And as you can see here on the slide, these activities can improve employee performance. A lot of times when you feel that your company is being positive or is making a contribution towards society, you're more motivated. Uh, if you uh, work for a company that is um, making contributions that uh, help the environment, that help education, that help other causes, you may feel more of a vested interest in making sure that mission is, uh, is accomplished. And then, of course, customer loyalty. Uh, a lot of times in especially nowadays, you have a lot of customers who are into this social responsibility in terms of looking at companies that are green, that, are, that have sustainable solutions, that are helping the environment, uh, that are changing materials in their packaging, that are using less energy, that are coming up with alternative ways of producing their products. These are becoming very important when we talk about packaging a product and putting certain labels on it, and uh, you all know that when you go to the grocery store, you'll see packaging uh, that, that may 
say, 100% natural, or it might make certain claims, such as high in antioxidants, plant-based, recycled materials, all of these things kind of uh, make an impression on, on a consumer, and they would be more likely to support products that they perceive uh, to be uh, contributing to uh, societal benefits. And of course, this generates positive publicity and, and sales. Uh, there are actually tax breaks that companies get as a result of having green solutions. And there is later on in the chapter, they talk about greenwashing, uh, this idea that companies are purporting to have green solutions more so than in actuality. Uh, and we'll get into to that later. So it also talks about socially responsible efforts attract goodwill, publicity, and potential customers and employees, generates indirect long-term benefits, such as greater employee commitment and improved business performance. That is the hope that you're working, that you work for an organization that has these uh, values and that you can feel good about going to work in the morning. Now here's a chart that I found very interesting. And if you look at this chart for a few seconds, you may have a question if you know what these companies do. But I'll give you a few seconds to look at these 10 companies and then we'll, we'll chat about each one very quickly. So what do you notice? you notice that it says best corporate citizens. Hasbro. Hasbro is a, a toy company. And they've been a big toy company for decades. And of course, Hasbro brings good memories to all of us uh, because what child doesn't like toys? And so Hasbro had all of these shiny, glowy toys that we all enjoyed. Um, in our childhood. And so you can kind of understand why they're number one in terms of the providing a common good for families and their children. You look at number two. Number two is a technology company. And we all use computing technology, whether it's a cell phone, tablet, laptop, or even some of your other devices in your house or in your home that Intel is providing us with the, uh, the engine uh, that gives us the access to uh, the functionality of uh, computer technology. And so we can kind of understand that as well. You look at Microsoft, same rationale. We, many of us use Microsoft products. And even if you're an Apple user, you use Microsoft products because they have an office suite. They have software for Apple products as well. Microsoft at one time was the uh, mega giant corporation, similar to what Google is today. But Microsoft was that company that was the 800 pound gorilla. It kind of flexed its muscles here and abroad and Bill Gates, of course, was the iconic figure uh, for Microsoft, who's now doing a lot more in terms of social responsibility than he is with Microsoft. But you may wonder about number four. And if you don't know the company, Altria, I can actually just Google Altria and give you an idea of what this company does. So this is Altria. And you may wonder, well, What's wrong with this? It looks like people in a laboratory and this looks like a technology park. No, this is a tobacco company. 
So as it says here, if you look, Altria's companies include some of the most enduring names in American business with strong American heritage stretching back more than 80, 180 years. For over two decades, Altria has led the industry with premium tobacco brands, a focus on harm reduction and strong financial performance. So it is a tobacco company that sells tobacco products or cigarettes and its um, products like it. Now, many years ago, there was a case against seven tobacco companies, and it was a lawsuit. And the lawsuit basically stated that many of these CEOs of these companies that sold tobacco products knew of the harmful effects of tobacco for its users, but decided that they would either ignore those warnings or pretend that they didn't exist. And so there was a court case and it was called the, it was the, um, had a funny name. It was a case against the seven, they were called the seven dwarfs. So here you have this big case and this case was in the mid-90s, 94, the case of Jeffrey Wigand that was made into a movie called The Insider featuring Russell Crowe. This movie was characterizing the case of the American public versus Big Tobacco. And as you can see here, the testimony of the seven CEOs of Big Tobacco, known as the Seven Dwarfs. And as you can see here to the left, they were in court. They testified before court, uh, in a court, that tobacco is not addictive. And they all repeated that statement. And obviously, when uh, the data was uh, released, it was found that they knew that they were selling a an addictive and poisonous and toxic product. And so this movie, The Insider, featured a scientist who worked for one of the tobacco companies that journalists were pursuing because they wanted him to talk about what he did for a living. And basically, as a chemist, he was charged with ensuring that the chemical reactions penetrated the blood barrier and people would get addicted to that product. That's what he did for a living as a chemist. And there were all kinds of documents. And so Jeffrey Wigand became this uh, whistleblower. And as you can see here, you have references to Jeffrey Wigand and the movie, The Insider, which um, won a lot of awards. And I'll just give you a taste of what The Insider um, was like or what it was about. So as you can see here, you have this Google search, Seven Dwarfs Tobacco. And this is a story about the case against the seven CEOs of Big Tobacco. And one of the principal figures was Jeffrey Wigand, who was a chemist for one of the companies. And there is a movie called The Insider, headlined by Russell Crowe, who plays Jeffrey Wigand. And as this chemist, he was pursued by journalists because journalists was, they were trying to get to the bottom of the story of the seven CEOs denying that cigarettes had a negative effect on the health of its users. So they're after Jeffrey Wigand and they want him to talk about his, his work. So the company that he works for gets wind of this the journalist intentions and they pull Jeffrey Wigand into the office and remind him not so subtly about his confidentiality agreement 
and also not so subtly um, threatening uh, legal action if he so much as to talk about what he did. Basically, what Jeffrey Wigand's job was as a chemist was to figure out ways that the chemical reaction in cigarettes could penetrate the blood barrier, could pass the brain, the, the blood barrier, and that the brain would have certain types of reactions to the chemical, and then addiction would take place after that. And, and of course, Mr. Wigand knew that. The tobacco companies knew that cigarettes were addictive. But under oath, and as you can see, The video on the left is footage from the seven CEOs testifying in court that cigarettes were not addictive. They raised their hand under oath and they testified that cigarettes are not addictive or they don't feel cigarettes are addictive. So that's why they had to keep Jeffrey Wigand from speaking. So this movie, The Insider, won a lot of awards, and I will actually show you just a touch of the trailer from this movie, uh, which if you have a couple of hours, I think um, you will find it uh, very, uh, very dramatic and very exciting, and of course, based on a true story. You go public and 30 million people hear what you gotta say. Nothing, I mean nothing, will ever be the same again. Now the work we did here is confidential, not for public scrutiny, any more than on one's family matters. We're very serious about protecting our interests. He's got something to say, he wants to say it, I want about 60 minutes. Maybe for the audience, it's just voyeurs and something to do on a Sunday night. And maybe it won't change a thing. People like myself and my family I left hung out to dry, used up, alone. What does this guy have to say? I don't be paranoid to yeah. him. That threatens these people. That isn't cigarettes are bad for you. Who is this? <gasps> I have no right to hide behind a corporate agreement. We can talk, we can air it. The worst kind of an organized smear campaign against a whistleblower. Shoplifting, failing to pay child support. They can paint everything with that brush. What, what are you going to do now? Finesse me, lawyer me some what? more. Try Mr. Williams. If we aired this segment, I was told. Don't talk. My own business. It could be a grave risk. We're doing this with or without you, bro. Are you a businessman or are you a newsman? He's only the key witness. So there you have that the insider, which is a wonderful characterization of that case uh, in terms of ethics. And I believe it's something that we all can, can learn from. Uh, and so I go back to this ranking of having Altria, which by the way is a FAMU partner and they do recruit here. But if you work for an organization like Altria or RJ or Philip Morris, then you have to make these assessments on your own, uh, whether the organization that you work for is delivering a common good and keeping its consumers safe. After this Seven Dwarfs case, those tobacco companies had to make sure that they inform the users of the perhaps effects of using tobacco. So they had the warning labels that they put on the side of cigarettes that you see today. There was also a suggestion that they should put more graphic details of how cigarettes can have a deleterious effect on one's health. When I was overseas, I was in an airport, one of those customs uh, airports, duty-free shops, and I was looking at the magazines, and next to the magazines, they had these cigarettes, and the cigarettes had these messages. 
Cigarettes will kill you. Don't smoke. Cigarettes cause cancer. And I looked at this, and these are cigarettes being sold. And I'm thinking, you have, you're selling these cigarettes, but then you have these warning, stark warning labels discouraging me from buying. Now, those of who buy cigarettes are addicted, so they will buy them, but then hopefully plant that psychological imprint you know, in their, in, in their mind. And that's what consumer behavior is. is um, uh, that's what consumer behavior is. But these organizations have a right to protect uh, the, consumer, the consumer health. And so that's what that whole case was about. All the other companies you have seen before, Campbell's, Cisco, Cisco Networking, Accenture, Hormel Foods, Lockheed Martin, the maker of the airplanes, and Echolab. Uh, Echolab is one of those uh, companies that is um, an advocate for clean water, fresh air, and all the other things that you hear a lot about in terms of environmental sustainability these days. They have many of these organizations and now a lot of companies can get tax breaks because they have a stamp on their products or that it has been said to be green. Um, you have green marketing, green uh, buildings, and all of these things that will provide companies with uh, a marketing advantage because people tend to feel that this company is looking out for my best interests, so I will support it. Seventh generation, which is actually in the book, they have um, on page 113, they have a picture of seventh generation products, which are these products that do not have the chemicals that can contaminate uh, water supply. And so these are plant based detergents that are, are sold as a better alternative to environmental. Uh, uh, a better alternative to the products like Tide and Cheer and all the, the ones that have the, the uh, detergents uh, in them. So again, that is what we call green marketing is, is something that is uh, very common these days. Marketing citizenship. So as a company, if you have a business or if you work for a company, you are a corporate citizen, and it is up to your company to follow your mission. And part of that mission will be the safety and the welfare of the consumers. Also, you're looking to ensure that your investors, your stakeholders are satisfied. Now, you have, sometimes you'll have people saying negative things uh, and say that, well, hey, I'm a company. I have to make sure my stockholders, my shareholders are happy. And that this executive would do anything just to make profits. So sometimes you have scenarios that are painted where, where you see this. You see CEOs making questionable decisions, offshoring, using you know, child labor, sweatshops, and all of these questionable practices, violating regulations. And these are some of the things that, that you hear about with uh, corporate social responsibility. But at a basic level, corporate citizens have to provide a return on investment, an ROI to their owners and investors, create jobs for the community, that's what a lot of them will uh, pledge to do. Contribute goods and services to the economy, engage in fair competition, and build ethical customer relationships. So these are some of the, the baseline of points that need to be adhered to as a corporate citizen. Here you have a pyramid. Economic, be profitable, but not to the expense of the consumers. So you have to be profitable, but, of course, you want to ensure that you're, you're doing it within ethical boundaries as well. So this pyramid on page 93 talks about being profitable, or I would say being viable, being a viable company. And there's um, this issue with the coronavirus brings uh, a, a point, uh, a major point, 
when you talk about making profits, but making sure that your employees have a safe place, that they have masks, that they're social distancing, that there are certain uh, sanitation uh, methods that uh, are going to be uh, adhered to in order to ensure that it's a safe place to work. And also you have the legal question. Recently, there have been cases where companies have been cited. And this is a, an article here in Denver. It talks, talks about 115 businesses cited for violation of face mask order. And this was actually a mandate by the Office of uh, Public Health and Environment that you had to have these masks on in your businesses. And so you had 115 countries, companies that were cited uh, as a result of these violations, employees not wearing face coverings, no social distancing. And they actually give the number and you wonder how can they tell how do they have these numbers? Well, they do their audits and they go around and they, they, they look and see um, what these companies are doing. And so you have 115 companies that uh, were cited. And then frankly, some companies have decided that they're going to close because it is very difficult to police your consumers. Some restaurants are closing again after customers throw fits over wearing masks. And so it is very difficult to force people to wear masks because they will say, well, I have rights. And if I want to get the virus, that, um, that's up to me. And I should have my, my amendment, you know, my freedoms to not wear a mask if I so choose not to wear one. And of course, the mask is not for you. It's for to protect others from getting the virus. And so you have all of these questions that companies are ha having to address now because of the coronavirus, the uh, desperation of being profitable, but also being safe. And also doing what's right. The working conditions, making sure that it's safe, avoiding harm, um, and at the top of the pyramid is being philanthropic. That means giving to the community, providing certain opportunities, and not only from a business standpoint, but from a community standpoint. And so this represents the, cor the pyramid of corporate social responsibility. Of course, corporate ethics, marketing ethics, the public, the regulators, the private interest groups, consumers, the industry, at large, which generally will have standards, and the organization or company itself. Cause-related marketing. When you talk about recently, you have a lot of companies that are supporting Black Lives Matter. I mentioned the one with Sprite. It's a very nice ad. that it It's narrated, and it supported Black Lives Matter. In the past, you have seen companies do similar uh, announcements about breast cancer awareness, and uh, other types of uh, causes uh, that they want to associate with. And of course, this has a positive, uh, it, it, it makes a positive impression in, in terms of these, these um, uh, prono pronouncements that these companies are making. And then strategic philanthropy. You're providing this generosity to this organization, whether it be an HBCU or whether it be the United Negro College Fund, to give the impression that you're supporting the African-American community. And that may very well be so. But of course, it may also be strategic in the way that, that you're doing this. And it is true with many other types of, of causes. They might be political. Uh, they may be... Um, business oriented in terms of appealing to the community that's around you and you want to make it appear that you're providing a common good for the community that you're in. So it can be uh, strategic, maybe given to a local school or maybe doing some community service 
or maybe hiring um, those from the local school. Uh, that's not necessarily philanthropy, but that's also providing a being a good corporate citizen and providing opportunity for for the community that that, that you're in. Again, other buzzwords, sustainability, consumerism, community relations. Sustainability is a key word when you talk about sustaining sustainable business practices, making sure that you're using materials that and practices that are uh, sustainable in the sense that uh, you're providing some uh, protection of the environment, long-term protection making sure that you're not using materials that are non-biodegradable. McDonald's many years ago said that we're not using styrofoam anymore for our products. We're going to use paper products or some companies have said we're not using plastic straws because plastic straws can impale fish, they can impale, get caught into um, uh, certain uh, marine life. Uh, I saw a very uh, awful video about this uh, turtle who had a straw stuck up its nose and it had been like that for a long time apparently and they had these people were trying to get the straw out of its nose finally got it out and you can see the blood trickling down the, the turtle's nose and finally they pulled it out and that straw was about this much into that turtle's nose and it had been there for a long time and so these are some of the issues that uh, we hear about marine life, about the environment, that and the the idea of waste. We know about plastic waste, and that there are just tons of plastic bottles that are thrown into the uh, water, and they end up in landfills, and that that can't be broken down. Lots of organizations that have these labels that if you stamp these on your products, then that means that you have passed a certain uh, criteria in terms of meeting environmental standards or sustainability. And so you may see this on some of the products that you buy, uh, these green stamps and, you know, these pictures of, of leaves and green, you know, kind of friendly uh, products. And many companies get tax breaks for adhering to these environmental standards. And this is an incentive, but sometimes there, there might be uh, deception when you start saying that something is 100% natural. Well, what does that mean? What does 100% natural really mean? Does it mean it's healthier? Well, that's the implication until you begin to look further into the, the ingredients that are in that product. Then you might find that it is not really true what they're purporting by saying it's 100% natural. But these labels represent a standard uh, that the companies have to go through or adhere through before they can get that stamp of approval. As consumers, we have certain rights, rights to safety, rights to be informed, the packaging, the labeling, the instructions, the nutritional uh, the nutritional information, also the ingredients to know what is it that I'm putting in my body? What is it, what is it that I am drinking? Um, the serving sizes are important because if you have a chronic ailment, let's say you're diabetic and you like cookies, like many of us like cookies and we probably eat more than we should. But let's say you look on the packaging and it says one serving size and it has all of these, this nutritive uh, content. Now, this much saturated fat, fiber, iron, so on and so forth. And you're looking at it. But then you also see serving size. A single serving size is three cookies. Now, most of us eat more than three cookies. We just continue until until we can't have any more. We might look up. Uh, you, you have eaten three serving sizes. And so you have to multiply that by three. So the sugar, the fat, all of the other things that are associated with that label have to be multiplied by the number that you have, have eaten. And, and, and so you have to be informed to ensure that you 
uh, if you're a diabetic, you want to make sure that you don't go over that, uh, that threshold that will make you sick. Right to choose, of course. The regulatory bodies have a big hand into making sure that we have choices. Uh, we have a variety of choices at competitive prices that we can choose and we can weigh that information, we can read the labels, and we can make comparisons, we can read consumer reports, and we can make an informed choice. And also the right to be heard, to ensure that um, our consumer interests are heard. So you have the Better, Better Business Bureau, where you can go on and you can make comments about a business that you used, whether they be positive or negative. Most times with the Better Business Bureau, they're going to be negative. You have a complaint. And the Better Business Bureau will put that on a public forum so that people can read it and then downgrade the business that, is, uh, uh, that has offended that, those consumers. Marketing ethics. There are a lot of cases out here. When you talk about marketing ethics, I can recall a few. The Tylenol deaths uh, back in the 80s uh, in Chicago, someone tampered with uh, Tylenol, aspirin, and there were a number of people that died. So what Tylenol did is they pulled all of the Tylenol products off the shelf. They did an investigation and found out there was tampering. And they identified where this tampering, uh, where the, the bottles were sold. Then they repackaged and they had a triple seal. They sealed it and then you had the tab that you pull off. And then you have the safety cap where you have to press down in order to open the cap. So this be became a standard. Now, ethically, this company... Uh, was said to have have done a very good job in terms of its public relations because they admitted fault. They said it was our fault. We take total responsibility for it. And this is what we're going to do to fix the problem. So they had a, uh, this was a very good case of what to do when you have a public relations disaster. There are some other companies that I can think of that did not do so well, such as Union Carbide, with the Bhopal uh, crisis in India where a gas leak uh, killed uh, a number of people and blinded others, maimed others, and they refused to accept responsibility for it. You had the Coca-Cola incident in Belgium where people started getting sick uh, from drinking Coca-Cola. And what it was, it wasn't the Coke itself, it was the chemical that the Coke cans were sitting on that made people um, nauseous and overcome with, um, with uh, dizziness and some of them fainted. And um, this company, Coca-Cola, finally gave an organizational apology in, in, in terms of their uh, culpability for that, um, that case. And here, I'm actually looking for the Coca-Cola case. It's listed here. Uh, now, this was maybe a case where Coca-Cola did not react fast enough. And it mentions it here that some CEOs think that it will blow over. And the CEO at the time, Doug Iverster, uh, did not immediately react to the crisis. And he was later... Um, blasted for that in the media, that he didn't act fast enough in pulling all the Coca-Cola products off the shelf and investigating. And I think he was later replaced because that the pu publicity was very uh, damaging to, to the company. So, of course, trust is something of uh, a main is, is one of the main uh, factors when you start talking about this um, brand 
this um, brand quality is can I trust this brand can, is it, am I certain that I won't get sick or that uh, there's not something that I should uh, beware of because you know of these incidents that I'm hearing about Global trust in different industries, you have the financial services only at 54%, and probably because financial services are not always the most transparent. You can't see what's going on. You can't see what's going on with your bank deposits. You deposit money in the bank, what happens to it? Well, they lend it out to various people. We have heard of cases of the meltdown in 2008, the saving and loans organizations that were lending money out to for mortgages to people who Certainly, we're not in a financial condition to afford those homes. And when the mortgage ballooned, then those persons lost their homes. And a lot of those mortgage um, companies were on the hook. The insurance companies were on the hook. And that resulted in a big uh, recession. Uh, you also had the Michael Milken junk bond case, the Bernie Madoff, and all of these affected those who had um, particularly uh, the stakeholders who were investing in these companies and whose monies were used for other purposes. The Enron scandal was another one uh, that uh, in involved a whistleblower, much like Jeffrey Wigand, to uncover some unsavory practices in terms of um, energy, energy um, trading that, that took place uh, with Enron. And that company eventually had to close its doors. Here you have the marketing mix product information, as I mentioned before. What type of information? Uh, warning labels. Uh, we got a, an issue during the coronavirus where President Trump suggested that there could be some disinfectant that could be injected or that it should be looked into. And then thereafter, you had cases of bleach poisoning because people were thinking that, well, maybe I can get rid of this virus by drinking bleach. And there were cases of poisoning and people were using disinfectants. But there's a warning label that in the company that makes Clorox, uh, Clorox products said that we have to come out with another warning label that our products are not for internal use and so that they won't be on the hook for, uh, for being sued. Now, obviously, they have the warning label, so they're, they're, they're covered. But, of course, that was a very, um, very reckless, uh, a very reckless um, you know, statements, that, that suggestions that were being made in the... Um, when you talk about the president making those suggestions, it, it's um, been very, very reckless. And also those who stated that they will look into it. It's not to embarrass the, the, the president. But then you have other issues, distribution, making sure that your products come from valid channels. There are a lot of scams out there that you go to a site and you think you're at a site, an official site, but it's really a scam. And these companies are using products or they're using the name of other companies to get you to buy something. And then you find out that it's a scam that is not what you think it is. Uh, and then, then you have these uh, issues of being of co consumers being, um, being cheated, essentially. Promotion issues in terms of advertising, making sure that your advertising is not deceptive or you're not saying, uh, making illegal claims. One of the cases that I remember was Mott's apple juice. Now, if you drink Mott's apple juice, I'm not saying you shouldn't drink it now, but they had to face a case where they had claimed that Mott's was made of 100% apples, right? You see that. But then upon inspection, upon examination, Someone found out that there was very little apples, real apples, in the juice. That it was a percentage, but it was a smaller percentage, certainly not 100%. And so Mott's had to kind of walk back and say, okay, we're going to correct the issue. 
that was irresponsible on our part, and then they had to go forward with a, a different constitution of, of that product. And of course, pricing. You have all of these different tactics of uh, bringing people in at a lower price, but then later on, them having to buy things in addition to what you've marketed to them. I was in Best Buy once looking at this flat screen TV. I wasn't going to buy it. It was a 75 inch screen. Beautiful. Resolution, clear, crisp. It's almost as if you can put your hand and touch whatever you are watching, right? So I'm looking at that and I asked the person, is this what I get if I bought this and opened up the box? And then he started telling me about all the other things I needed and all the other things that this TV was running on in terms of the bandwidth and the, at that time, Blu-ray player, 4K Blu-ray player, and you needed all of these other things. Now, if you took that TV and with the idea that you were going to get the same picture, you would, you would have been disappointed because you needed all these other things and you would have had to go back to Best Buy and buy all the other things to get the, the uh, product that you were looking for. So again, these are all questions of responsible advertising or responsible marketing. You have greenwashing, another case. Uh, people are talking about 100% natural, environmentally friendly. Uh, of course, even in the organic space, you have a lot that is uh, to be desired by companies' adherence to certain standards. When you say 100% natural, what does that mean? It can mean anything. You have products that are naturally occurring that can actually be negative, that can be damaging. Uh, you have a product that is 100% natural, but it can have certain hidden sugars in it that might be detrimental to you. You can have certain products that are plant-based, but again, may be damaging to uh, your health in, in many ways. So there's a, a fine line when you talk about greenwashing, not to mention other more extreme cases of bribery paying people to turn the blind eye to maybe egregious violations and ensuring that there are no labor unions to ensuring that your regulatory bodies are kept in check. Um, these are things that happen more overseas than you find here. The regulatory environment is very strict here, but overseas you find that it's uh, sometimes that can be bought and people will give you leeway in doing things that they probably should not uh, be doing. Lastly, factors that individual that influence the factors that influence the ethical decision making process. Individual factors like how we were brought up, our values, can determine what we will do in a situation. For example, Jeffrey Wigand, what would I have done if I were a chemist in that tobacco company? Would I have come forward and spoken to those journalists and also testified in court about what it is that I did for a living? Would I have done that? Or would I have just kept my silence? because of the snitching culture, you have a lot of people talking about, well, I don't want to be a snitch, right? But again, it is your own individual uh, moral compass that's going to play a role in, in what you do. Or if you sing somebody else do something wrong, what would you do? Would you say something? Would you be quiet? Of course, we have our own individual, um, the individual uh, levels of... Um, we have our own conscious you know, that, that we deal with. Idea of opportunity. I used to work for a computer company and that computer company had, um, I was a marketing support rep and I was working with, with sales reps. And these sales reps would sold a lot of equipment. We had three of the top 10 sales reps in the country. 
I was a marketing support, so I made sure that our customers were happy with the products that they were using. And I had one sales rep who sold a system to University of Chicago, which was one of my accounts. I had about 30 accounts, and they had to handhold them, give demos, phone support, um, on-site support, talk classes. And so I go out to this account, and they were having problems uh, with the system. And it just so happens that the sales rep told the system administrator that the software would do X, Y, and Z. And I'm thinking, okay, I know the software. I'm thinking this. The software doesn't do X, Y, and Z. Why did he tell her that? Well, he wanted to make his quota. And I hate to say that. I hate to say that, but he was, in the, he was one of those three sales reps who was in the top 10, and he sold a lot of equipment. And it was just a horrible situation because I had to make it right. As the marketing tech support rep, I had to make it right. It was a very uncomfortable situation, and I got through it. But I never saw that sales rep in the same way. I never saw him the same way again because I thought it was just unethical what he did. I didn't blow the whistle on him, but when I worked with him, I just kept that in the back of my mind um, to, to, to ensure that, um, you know, that I knew what I was dealing with as far as his, his um, business dealings were concerned. And he left there and he went to work for Apple. So I hope hopefully he was a lot better there. And then, of course, organizational relationships, you know, ensuring that as a organization, your mission is um, what your employees will buy into and that everybody has the same charge in moving this uh, organization forward and making ethical decisions uh, as a whole. Here's some um, statistics about ethical conduct, observed conduct, and we're talking about people who have seen these things in the workplace, 30%, abusive behavior, 22 lying to stakeholders, 22%, conflict of interest. So it's a lot of stuff here. Report ob observed misconduct, 76%. So that whole whistleblower is... Uh, it's a pretty high clip, and generally that's going to be anonymous, so you don't have to worry about mm -hmm. being um, uh, there be some repercussions for you um, making uh, making a, a statement about some wrongdoings internally. Um, but there there have been those that experience retaliation. So in ethics, you, you want to make sure that uh, you feel good about where you work and about the environment that you're in. You don't ever want to be in an environment where you feel that I can't work here because these are some unscrupulous people. You just have to move on because you don't want to, to be considered as abetting unscrupulous behavior and make sure that uh, you feel good leaving work and you can go to bed at night and say that, yeah, I'm, this is a place that I, I like the environment. I like what we're doing as a company. Uh, you will see things in your place of work that you might not like, and you have to make a decision. Do I stay here? Do I just turn a blind eye to it? And those are things that we grapple with on a frequent basis. So that's all I'm going to say today. And so we, this is uh, chapter four, and you will... You will find some other interesting information in Chapter 4, including the Code of Ethics of the American Marketing Association that is first tenant, do no harm. And there was a tagline, I believe it was Facebook. It might, it might, it might even be Google. Don't be evil or do no evil. It's kind of a, kind of a mission that a com the company has to ensure that they are abiding by the rights of consumers. Uh, actually, it was Google. Don't be evil is is the um, is the 
is their corporate code of conduct. And each um, company should have that and they should adhere to it. So hopefully you all will uh, read chapter four. I may have some exercises. So you want to look at those and make sure that you are looking at the uh, announcements. Uh, we are not meeting today. This is um, just a video that you will watch on your own as a self-study. And on Tuesday, we will meet via Zoom again. Uh, we have done well on the exams and uh, we had a, an 82 average, which is very good. And, and so have a good weekend and hopefully you all are all settled into the semester and I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Take care.